Okay, so that was the prosecution's opening statement in the police cover-up trial. Let's talk a little bit more about it because we will be live there later this afternoon. So joining me right now, very special guest, senior legal editor at longcrime.com, our very own home, Ron Blitzer. Ron, great to see you, and thanks for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be here. Okay, let's talk about this case. What does this case mean for you in the sense that there's a, I don't always see cases like this. Yes, we talk about police shootings, but here you're talking about a police cover-up. What do you think the nation's looking for here? I think the nation's looking for accountability for something that goes beyond just a bad decision in the heat of the moment. You know, you look at the original case, the underlying case here with the death of Laquan McDonald, and you look at an officer who was found to have acted wrongly. He acted in the heat of the moment. He shot and fired his gun when he shouldn't have, killing someone. It was deemed by the court to be unjustified, and he's going to pay the price for it. But what happened next, in a way, is so much worse, because this wasn't something where someone acted uh, in a short amount of time without having the ability to really analyze a situation. This was officers acting with hindsight after the bad act occurred and allegedly trying to cover it up, falsifying documents, trying to kind of brush everything under the rug. And it's bad enough that someone died uh, when they shouldn't have. But to have police officers who are supposed to be protecting the people instead trying to protect themselves, I think that's in a way worse. Yeah, this is a case that you don't always see down the pipeline, but it's one that we're shedding some very interesting light on police department uh, investigations and tactics. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay, so let's break down these defense opening statements back here with Ron Blitzer. Ron, my first question to you, uh, you have three different attorneys representing three different clients. Is there a strategy between the three of them? Uh, it doesn't seem to be, uh, at least in my opinion. I think especially when you look at the first two, it's a very, very different approach. Uh, you have the first one that we saw where the attorney comes off uh, almost angry, uh, you know, acting like this is you know, some miscarriage of justice that we're even in this courtroom to begin with. And his strategy uh, in his opening appears to be basically relitigating the underlying case. Uh, saying how you know Laquan McDonald, you know, was wrong. How you know he was this violent criminal, and how you know, the officer here, you know, didn't do anything wrong in you know reporting about what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can you contrast that with the second one we saw, which was a much more measured approach, talking about perception, which is a lot tougher to challenge because you could say, well, this is how things happen in my opinion, but when you're talking about how the officer perceived the events, it's a lot tougher to then say, oh no, he didn't perceive it that way, because who's to say how one person perceives something else? And I think that that defense, in my opinion, is a lot more effective. When you have an attorney, uh, like the defense attorney uh, for the first opening there, uh, basically just shouting at the jury. No going, jury, it's a judge. Oh, right. It, it's not even a jury. This is a bench trial. So basically shouting at the judge, who's very familiar uh, with what happened here, and saying that the other case basically got it wrong. Nothing here, uh, there was no wrongdoing here on the, on the police's part, and just kind of banging the table. You know, to me, that shows that the attorney himself may not actually have a lot of faith in his own case. And he's just trying to put on as much of a show as he can to make it seem that he really believes it. Well, we're going to have to see how it ultimately happens. And we know that the defense will take up their case uh, maybe later on today. We have to see what happens with the prosecution and whether or not they'll get those emails in. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, a lot more to talk about. That's Officer Joseph McGilligott, a key witness in this whole saga. Let's come back to Ron. Ron, you're listening to this testimony. The idea, again, is trying to say, was the shooting justified? Is that the real issue in this trial? Or is it to say, hey, listen, these men didn't falsify the reports because based upon their observations, based upon who they spoke to, it was reasonable to conclude that Laquan McDonald was engaged in illegal behavior, maybe even an aggravated assault, and that's what they reported. But the problem is they didn't classify this as what it really was, a homicide. Do you think that they were too quick to put the blame on Laquan McDonald? Was this sloppy police work, or was this a cover-up? 
personally, I think it's a cover-up. I think that their defense is doing the best job that they can to try and say, no, no, they were right. They wrote what they saw, and trying to uh, you know, find the nuance between uh, the decision to shoot and the decision to write that Laquan McDonald did something wrong. You know, you can still believe that Laquan McDonald was maybe an aggressor or that he had been committing crimes and report that. And that's different from what happened with Van Dyke, where you're actually saying that this warrants using deadly force. Uh, you can say that maybe if, you know, the past case had resulted in finding that deadly force was not warranted, that doesn't mean that Laquan McDonald was completely innocent. So if the officers were saying that, based on our perception, Laquan McDonald did this, he did that, this is how we're addressing the case, we perceive this as this guy was a criminal who was doing something wrong and we treated this case accordingly, uh, that is a separate issue necessarily from whether or not his death was justified. One of the arguments that seems to be coming up, and we see this with Detective David March, and remember he had custody over key pieces of evidence in this case, including that dash cam footage that we keep replaying. One of the arguments that seems to be flouted is, well, if he really wanted to cover this up, why didn't he do something to the tape? Why didn't he get rid of this piece of evidence? So you're just looking at his reports claiming he falsified them. Is that really how you do a cover-up? What would you say to that argument? I think it's a, it's a creative argument, basically saying, oh, well, if they, wanted to do, if they wanted to cover this up, they would have done a better job covering it up. We've seen that argument before. Yeah, and, and you know, if, you know, lacking anything else, uh, and I think that this is a very tough case for uh, a defense attorney here, uh, it doesn't necessarily hurt to go with that. Because uh, one question that always comes up here is, why would police try and cover this up when the whole thing was on video? How can you write in your reports that it happened one way when we can all see that that's not true? So when you're kind of facing an uphill battle like that, if you want to just lean into that and say, yeah, you're right. You know, they wouldn't have tried to cover something up when the evidence to the contrary was right there. So, of course, it wasn't a cover up. You know, it's an interesting argument. I don't buy it, but it's as good as any other. And do you believe this is a cover up just to protect their fellow officer, or do you think there was some other motive involved here? I think it's probably to protect the officer. I, you know, when you have something here, this was an officer who, you know, shot first, didn't you know, think he acted irrationally, did, didn't do what he was supposed to, and you know, killed someone you know, unjustly, and you had other officers there who, you know, are trying to spin this, you know, in one way or another, probably not thinking that this is going to result in they themselves facing criminal charges. So you think it's a cover-up, so what would you say to the argument that keeps, that we've also seen one of the attorneys say, hey, listen, this is not, uh, you may disagree with this report, it doesn't make it false. Just because you disagree with what it says, it's not a false report. What would you say to that? I'd say look at the videotape. Uh, you know, you see what happened there. It doesn't match up with how they reported it. You know, if you want to look at the specific wording and say, well, technically this is true, or technically, you know, it's not refuted by the video, you know, that's the best shot you got as a defense attorney to say, well, technically, you know, this doesn't rise to the level of, you know, falsifying anything, even if you disagree with, you know, their interpretation of the events. I think, you know, if you're trying to nitpick, trying to play semantics, trying to, you know, find any kind of, you know, discrepancy between, you know, what, you know, you may think they were trying to do versus what was actually on the paper, you know, technicalities, I think, are the best case you have. I don't think it's going to work. All right. Well, we are going to talk more about this case, but when we come back, we're switching gears, and we are going to focus on Jeffrey Epstein. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. So we are about to preview a brand new trial here on the network. We expect to see openings maybe Thursday, maybe Friday, and this is a case that you've probably seen in the news. It's about Jeffrey Epstein. Let's talk about him right now. So Jeffrey Epstein was a Palm Beach multimillionaire who you might remember was accused of getting all of these underage girls together back in the early 2000s with the help of recruiters and forcing them into sex acts with him and very high profile friends. Now, 
you might be saying, well, he's probably been in federal prison for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. No. He worked out a deal with prosecutors where he would plead guilty to two state charges for prostitution. He spent 13 months in county jail, registered as a sex offender, was ordered to pay restitution to victims. He was allowed to work from home, and he and his accomplices received immunity from federal charges. One last thing. The victims of Mr. Epstein, they weren't notified of this plea deal. So what does that bring us in 2018? Well, there's a man named Bradley Edwards. He's an attorney who represented some of these victims. He originally was sued by Mr. Epstein, claiming that Edwards was involved in a Ponzi scheme. Now, that w lawsuit was ultimately withdrawn. Mr. Edwards has fired back at Epstein and said he only filed that suit because I represented all of these women, all of these young girls that claimed he molested them. So this is really malicious prosecution and slander. That's what brings us to the current lawsuit that we're going to be covering here. That's that lawsuit. But as a part of that lawsuit, we believe many of the victims of Epstein will come forward and testify in this trial. We believe that the names of Donald, President Donald Trump, President Bill Clinton will be brought up in this litigation because it's believed that they may have had involvement or knowledge about what was happening with Mr. Epstein. One other thing to note, high-profile attorney Alan Dershowitz has actually been accused of being one of the people that took advantage of the, well, at least one of these underage girls. He has flat-out denied this time and again, and he will be interviewed by our very own Brian Ross here on Law & Crime a little bit later on in the program. But we want to break down what's happening in this case right now, and I want to bring back in Ron Blitzer. So, Ron, my first question to you is, how on earth, when federal law says that these victims should have been notified about this plea deal, why were they not? It's an outrage. And uh, as a former prosecutor, this blows my mind that you can make a decision like this to, you know, let this guy off with, you know, basically nothing and not even notify the victims uh, when I was a prosecutor even if I was handling a misdemeanor assault case where, you know, it was a you know, relatively minor offense, if I was making any kind of an offer to a defendant in that case to dispose of the case, I would have to talk to the victims first as a matter of policy. Uh, you talk to the victims, say, listen, you know, this is what, you know, the defendant is facing. This is what we're prepared to offer them. Are you okay with this? And if they weren't, then we would, you know, work accordingly. Then if they were, then we would try and, you know, work out a plea. One of the arguments that they came forward with was, listen, if they took, you know, they, if this lawsuit, if this uh, plea deal fell through, uh, then that there was a danger that this idea that they were going to be paid restitution, uh, because that's one of the things of his plea deal, that that could have been brought up at a trial and it made these, these women look like they were just falsely accusing him for money. Um, that was one of the arguments that came forward. My biggest question is, how is he not in federal prison? We know that um, Mr. Acosta, who was one of the um, one of the key prosecutors in this case, he's now the, I believe, the Department of Labor, Secretary of Labor. He said that he was pressured by multiple attorneys, Epstein's legal team, to taking this plea deal. So I'm going to say this. Wait, what? Yeah, uh, the idea that you're going to let. Uh, defense attorneys bully the government into doing something. Uh, I don't buy that at all. Uh, you know, if you know this was, you know, some sort of, you know, you know, if they were claiming that they were really bull bullying prosecutors here. You know, if the defense attorneys were doing something wrong, then you go after those attorneys. Uh, you, you know, if they commit crimes, you go after them. If they're acting unethically, then you report them to the bar. But you know, if they're just pressuring, you know, as far as, you know, you know, negotiations, you know, you can stand up to that. The idea that, you know, you were being pushed around by attorneys, I don't care how high profile they are, that doesn't sit with, well with me. Okay, wait a second. We just got a breaking update. I want, I think it's in regards to the Epstein lawsuit. Let me just confirm. Yes, believe it or not, as we were just talking about this, a settlement has been reached in the Jeffrey Epstein civil lawsuit. This means there will be no trial. This means that these victims will not have their day in court. Ron, what do you think about this? 
Huh, well, you know, you know, we were just talking about how we have this big trial starting in a couple of days, and now it's not going to be happening, apparently. You know, we, we don't know the details yet of this settlement. Uh, an attorney for, you know, I'm reading right now, an attorney for Edwards uh, announced in court that a settlement has been reached. The details are confidential right now. So, you know, we don't know, you know, what kind of figures are involved here, what, you know, the terms of this agreement are. But, yes, a uh, settlement has been reached. Uh, we're not going to be going to a trial here. Uh, they reached a mutually satisfying disposition. That is shocking. This is we... according to uh, local WPTV. Wow. Uh, thanks to them for reporting this. You know, it should be noted that there is a second lawsuit about the, whether or not this plea deal uh, back, this what he pled guilty to back in the day, should be invalidated because these victims weren't notified. Um, that's a second chapter. We'll talk more about it later. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It has just been reported that a settlement has been reached between Jeffrey Epstein and Bradley Edwards in their civil suit, which is really surprising because one of the things that we were anticipating was whether or not many of the victims who claim that they were sexually molested by Mr. Epstein and several of his high-profile friends, whether they would be able to testify in that upcoming trial. But there will be no trial. Back here with Ron Blitzer. Ron, I imagine we can speculate here. We're still learning the details uh, of what happened with this settlement. As soon as we learn more, we'll make sure to bring it to you. But the idea here that there was a settlement reached at the 11th hour, I mean, we th we're expecting openings this week in that trial. What does that tell you about the, you think it was all about the victims, that he didn't want them to testify? I think that's as good a guess as any. I think that's highly likely uh, you know, as you know, court watchers and analysts. You know, we were looking forward to getting some of the details out about these allegations and the high-profile names attached to them, you know, people like President Donald Trump, President Bill Clinton, uh, yeah, and you know now, you know, as far as what they knew, you know, what they might have seen, uh, and now you know, we're not going to get that information, and that could have been part of the idea behind the settlement. Again, we're just waiting for more details. As soon as something happens, we're going to jump back in. Uh, there's a p potential of a press conference, but we're waiting to see if that's going to happen. Uh, I do want to ask Ron one other quick question. This might not be the end of the day for the victims. Remember, they were never notified. They weren't initially notified of this plea deal that he took back in the day, where he didn't receive federal prison time. But the idea here is there is a second lawsuit. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to jump in. There's a press conference happening right now in the Epstein matter. Let's jump live. This would have, this would have revealed itself as the distraction that Jeffrey Epstein wanted it to be in reality. Um, those victims, though, because of the good journalism, and, and, and Julie Brown, I want to thank you specifically for really just digging in. Everybody for 10 years has taken snippets of information and tried to make headlines, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, sometimes true, sometimes false. I felt like half the time I was just trying to correct a record. Finally, we had somebody just dig in and get it right. Still the tip of the iceberg, but everything is getting it right. And you know what? I'm now getting calls from my clients who have been hidden, who have been pushed into silence, scared to death. Finally saying, one, Brad, thank you for standing up to him and pushing him to the brink till he had to admit you win, he lost. Thank you. Second, they're willing to talk. They want to share their story. This was part of their healing. This was never about me. I took this case to, to the end for them, and the focus should go back on them. The focus should never have been on me and sitting through two weeks for me to prove that everything that I've been saying from the beginning of time till now is true and everything in retaliation that was said by Jeffrey Epstein against me to try to extort me into abandoning my clients, which I refused to do, was false. I didn't need those two weeks. You heard it in his own words. What more can I ask for in the fact that I got to do that without needing to draw my clients in to testify and be cross-examined and get beaten up for no reason and suffer and hurt any further wasn't fair to them. So what happened today was a win, and it allows me to do what I do. I help people who can't help themselves. That's it. That's what I want to do. 
The first time that Courtney Wilde walked into my office in 2008 and said, look, the government's not paying attention to me. Can you make it happen? She was not asking for money from Jeffrey Epstein. She just wanted somebody to pay attention to her. And when I realized that the U.S. Attorney's Office, for whatever reason, was not interested in prosecuting Jeffrey Epstein and was more interested in immunizing Jeffrey Epstein, I filed a lawsuit, an emergency, a petition for a violation of crime victims' rights, and I walked it into the federal courthouse. At that time, I had never practiced in federal court. All I had was passion. And I walked it in and I handed the pleading in to the lady who was at the desk. Courtney Wilde was right outside, ready at the time. She told me, this is an emergency. And I told the clerk, I want a hearing. And she said, wait, I said, now. What's going on is wrong, I want it now. And she took it back to her boss and she came back and said, you don't get a hearing now. It doesn't even say emergency on this first pleading. I said, give me that paper back. I hand wrote emergency on it and handed it right back to her. It was an emergency then. Judge Mara treated it like an emergency then. We got right into court after I got laughed at by the clerk. But if you go back to docket entry number one on the CVRA case, there's handwritten emergency and that's how that happened. From that day, we've treated that like an emergency. It's taken a really, really, really long time to get here. But now we're past the, the sideshow of what was allegations Jeffrey Epstein made against me that he's now said were categorically false. We can focus now back on the people that we care about and who need our help. That's our clients. So where do you, where do you go now? Where is the pursuit now? So, so, so the, step number one is we have filed our motion for summary judgment. If anyone is interested, you go to that case, 08-80736. It's docket entry 361. It lays out many of the, all the details you need. Judge Mara should rule on this at any moment, and I have a feeling that Mr. Scarola's entry of an appearance in this case, one of the first things that we are going to do is attempt to set a hearing. A hearing that I bet you, before today, we would have had two victims attend and scared to do that. And after today, we're going to have a volume of victims that are going to come forward and be ready to testify and not get cross-examined. Testify about what happened to them in a way that will help them heal. That'll be in federal court. That'll be in federal court, yes. And look, who knows what else is going to come out. I mean, the, the excellent journalism is now, has now has spread the message it's not just a state court case that's stuck in Palm Beach County now. People are really aware of what's going on. And there were times where people were aware, but were also scared to do something about it. So everybody's coming forward, and, and it, it feels like there's no more fear. Is it possible for Epstein to just keep settling out of court, keep the information from becoming public? Well, it, it, it's not possible for the information not to become public because the information is becoming very public. And if you really dig into all of the public court filings that I've been filing and Mr. Scarola has been filing for the last 10 years, you can find most of anything that you're looking for, whether he likes it or not. And I'll tell you, for the most part, he, he does not. Should Jeffrey Epstein be right? Jeffrey Epstein is not an unintelligent person. It would take a fool not to recognize that he faces extremely serious jeopardy at this point. He faces the distinct possibility that his sweetheart plea bargain can get set aside and that he and others will face federal criminal prosecution. There was a development this morning. I, I'm not I'm not aware of the complete details. It's been reported to me secondhand, but apparently an effort is being made in Congress to open an investigation with regard to the circumstances of how this plea bargain could possibly have been entered into. I practiced law for over 45 years. The first five of those years were spent as a criminal prosecutor. I have never seen, I have never heard of a plea bargain in which not only the prospective defendant, but the defendant's named and unnamed co-conspirators were granted blanket immunity for unnamed crimes. That just doesn't happen. That's inexcusable. 
There is no reasonable justification, regardless of what kind of evidence Jeffrey Epstein may have been secretly providing to some other prosecuting authority. There is no justification for keeping this deal secret, for violating the Crime Victims' Rights Act that affords victims an opportunity to be able to address the court before any plea bargain is approved by a judge, and there is absolutely no justification for the broad scope of immunity that was granted in this case. That is deserving of the kind of scrutiny that Julie Brown began to focus on this case and that hopefully the U.S. Congress will focus on this case as well. They can get answers that we can't get. So we're counting on, we're counting on that development as being very significant in terms of being able to ultimately bring Jeffrey Epstein to justice. This settlement is not going to have a direct impact on any other pending... Okay, so this breaking development, it just keeps getting uh, more interesting. A statement was released by Mr. Edwards. It says, while Mr. Edwards... Excuse me, this is... Sorry, this was released by Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I want to say this. This is, again, from Mr. Epstein. While Mr. Edwards was representing clients against me, I filed a lawsuit against him in which I made allegations about him that the evidence conclusively proves were absolutely false. The truth was that his aggressive investigation and litigation style was highly effective and therefore troublesome for me. The lawsuit I filed was my unreasonable attempt to damage his business reputation and cause Mr. Edwards to stop pursuing cases against me. It did not work. Despite my efforts, he continued to do an excellent job for his clients and through his relentless pursuit held me responsible. I am now admitting that I was wrong and that the things I said to try to harm Mr. Edwards' reputation as a trial lawyer were false. I sincerely apologize for the false and hurtful allegations I made and hope some forgiveness for my acknowledgement of wrongdoing. That, again, was from Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, I'd like to bring on um, Ron Blitzer. To, uh, we're going to jump back to the press conference right now. Let's go back live. They've been scared is because of the way that the media covers or has covered and has labeled specifically Jeffrey Epstein's victims from the very beginning. I don't know if everybody remembers, but back in 2008, the charge they allowed Jeffrey Epstein to plead to was soliciting a minor for prostitution. All of a sudden, if you came forward knowing that you were a 13 or 14 year old girl who had never engaged in prostitution in your entire life, you, you were born with that label if you were to stand up. And it's only very recently, as the climate has changed, that I've heard from some of these people that we recognized as witnesses a long time ago and promised them, if you don't want to be involved, I'm not going to get you involved. That's just my promise to you. Not going to do it to you. I've heard from them, and they've said, look, we're really thinking about it now because things have changed. The focus is on the right person, and there's nobody that re looks at these circumstances who would ever use some derogatory term to speak about these young women. And some of these young women are very, very, very successful people these days, which is scary to come forward, but also putting them on the verge, on the edge of making that jump, which would also be a big, big step, big advancement in the case. Well, the, 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 the first thing, though, is even if we were to win on the, the Crime Victims' Rights Act case, which our feeling is we should, if we invalidate that immunity deal, that doesn't mean the, state, the U.S. Attorney's Office has to charge him. They could enter into the same deal. It just means that they would have to speak with the victims first and actually afford them rights this time. They have prosecutorial discretion. But the focus of attention on this is going to make it more difficult for the government to want 
anything but an appropriate prosecution. Right? That's all that we can do. We can't, let's say new victims come forward. Let's say it's in California. There would still need to be a prosecutor in California that wants to prosecute this case. And everybody can go around asking, why is it that nobody, no U.S. Attorney's Office has ever wanted to prosecute, prosecute what looks like a very, very strong case against a very powerful political person. I don't have that answer for you, but hopefully somebody here can go get it. And one, one of the things that you need to understand as well is the very practical consideration that we are dealing in Florida with a restrictive statute of limitations. It would be very difficult at this point, if not impossible, to bring criminal charges arising out of conduct that occurred more than a decade ago. There are jurisdictions where that problem is not faced, but Florida is a jurisdiction where we face statute of limitations concerns. However, there very well could be the possibility of prosecution at the federal level based upon the illegal plea bargain that was entered into. We have not yet heard the rest of the story with regard to Secretary Acosta. He certainly hasn't spoken. Uh, I am hopeful that the congressional investigation that is being spoken of takes place. We will get more of the story at that point in time. I'm not here to call for Secretary Acosta's resignation. I don't know all the facts. I know that the facts that are known demand further answers. What are the precedents for uh, a non-prosecution agreement like this legally, and are there legal precedents then to undo something like this? There, there is no precedent for a non-prosecution agreement like this. <laughs> I am completely unaware of any non-prosecution agreement extending immunity to unnamed co-conspirators for unidentified crimes. I am entirely unaware of secrecy having been expressly bargained for in violation of the Crime Victims' Rights Act. One of the things that encourages us about the possibility of setting aside this plea bargain is that it was indeed Jeffrey Epstein and his, his dream team of high-powered, high-priced lawyers who insisted upon the secrecy provisions in violation of the Crime Victims' Rights Act. That puts Epstein in a position where it becomes difficult, if not impossible, for him to argue, I want to enforce a contract that I required have provisions that were violative of the Crime Victims' Rights Act included in the contract. The contract was illegal from the outset. He knew it was illegal from the outset. It needs to be set aside. We need to start from the beginning with regard to the issues with respect to that prosecution. And you're saying that the feds, if they decided to file charges, the statute of limitations would apply? I, I am saying that there's a very good argument that no statute of limitations applies with regard to the federal charges. You want to take that? Sure. Uh, there, I mean, there are some similarities, diff different age group targeted victims, but there are some similarities. And the most striking is, is, is the degree of power. I mean, you saw it first with Cosby, and people thought, nobody's going to believe me. This guy is, you know, he's the pudding pot man. And then, and then you have Harvey Weinstein, who's basically running Hollywood. And, uh, and that's somebody who Jeffrey Epstein knows. You know, those, are, those are people that know one another, and they run in the same circles. And once the victims started coming forward one after another, how many times, even after five, six, seven victims of Harvey Weinstein had come forward, were there still doubters? It wasn't until there were so many that Harvey Weinstein himself just couldn't take on the barrage of complaints that everybody said, you know what, that's right. So the victims here see the same thing. You know, as, as the numbers increase and as the skepticism decreases, 
And as we have a day like today where Jeffrey Epstein has admitted to wrongdoing, it's only going to increase the confidence of these young women who are now further along in their healing process than they were 10 years ago when we met them. So the, the, the chances of this moving in the right direction and having a situation like we had in a courtroom where you saw Larry Nasser and had to face one Olympic gymnast after another, after another, after another, that day should come, and that day will come. I disagree with Brad with regard to one significant point. These high-profile abusers are not running in the same circles. They are slithering in the same circles. They are crawling in the same circles. And there is no more running because there is no more place to hide. Thank you. Yes. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you thank also you. very much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all being here. Okay, so that's Bradley Edwards and his attorney, Jack Scarolo, a victory lap for them in this settlement. We read earlier how Jeffrey Epstein admitted that he made up these false allegations against Mr. Edwards because of what Mr. Edwards had represented all of these underage girls, and this was a form of retaliation. He admitted wrongdoing, and now there's a settlement. The details, Ron, of this settlement are still hidden, but there is some really interesting details how they're chapter two of this. One of the efforts being made in a separate litigation is to have the plea deal, this immunity agreement, this non-prosecution agreement that Jeffrey Epstein entered into back in the day in which he received no federal prison time, only a, a short amount of time in county jail, only had to register as a sex offender, and most importantly, his victims were not even notified of that plea deal. There is an effort to invalidate that plea deal, and based upon what we just heard in that press conference, there's a likelihood that could happen. Uh, yeah, we were hearing from the attorneys there, from Edwards and his lawyer, and they were saying how, you know, as far as the actual uh, victims here uh, and their allegations, you know, statutes of limitations may bar them from individually being able to uh, bring certain actions. But as far as this federal claim uh, regarding uh, this plea deal that they claim is illegal, they're claiming that. Uh, federal prosecutors did not notify the victims, and they were also be heard during this press conference criticism of the idea that there was blanket immunity granted as part of this deal. That you know that this you know, deal could be invalidated as a result of this litigation. Uh, then you could have uh, potentially you know either you know a harsher sentence or at least you know have victims you know get an opportunity to you know have their voices heard one of the strangest aspects of this plea deal and it kept being brought up by mr scarola was how in the plea deal it says that there is a, immunity is granted to any potential co-conspirators who were involved in epstein's crime so that is they're not listed it's just a blanket immunity he said he's never seen anything like this in a plea deal. Have you? No, I haven't. Uh, when you're saying any potential co-conspirators, that means people that you are aware of, people who you're not aware of, people who you might suspect but haven't built a case against yet. And, you know, you look at the, the circles that Epstein has been known to run in. You know, he's been reported to have been uh, friends with President Trump, President Clinton, Alan Dershowitz. Uh, you know, people who, you know, have either been accused of wrongdoing and denied it or people who have been said to maybe been aware of wrongdoing by others, you know, whether they were involved or not. Based on this uh, plea deal and this type of immunity, none of these people would face any consequences. And if this plea deal is eventually invalidated, who knows what could happen? Who knows who could be prosecuted? Who knows what could happen to Mr. Epstein and what information he has? The other important aspect to note in that press conference is that Jack Scarola said that there is, uh, he heard a congressional investigation into how this deal was arranged and understanding how Alexander Acosta, uh, who was one of the top prosecutors back in Miami and now a high level cabinet uh, member, how he was, why did he enter into this agreement? So it seems things are happening now from Washington. Yeah, as well they should. You know, I'd really like to get to the bottom of, you know, what was going on behind the scenes that led 
to this. You know, you have someone who's now in a position of power. He's in the cabinet. He's a secretary of labor. His name has been tossed around as a potential future attorney general of the United States. Uh, so, you know, if he's going to have that role, I want to know what happened here. I want to know what led to him giving such a sweet deal to Jeffrey Epstein, who's accused of such heinous crimes. And the idea that he was pressured by Epstein's legal team. Does that, sit, does that make sense? Because the other argument is he had all of this information uh, about the subprime mortgage crisis right when this happened. He testified, he provided some valuable information for successful prosecutions. Is that why he was granted this deal? You know, I honestly don't know. You know, I've read, you know, have, you know, the reports that, you know, they claim that they were pressured by defense attorneys. You know, Epstein had an all-star team, including Alan Dershowitz, who still is giving him legal advice uh, in issues related to this. Uh, but, you know, when you're a prosecutor, if you're granting any kind of deal, you know, you weigh, you know, the pros and the cons. You look at, okay, what am I giving up here and what am I getting out of this? And, you know, what are the benefits here to allow me to, you know, focus on other cases and make progress or, you know, try and prevent you know, something else from, from going or punishing other people for something. But I don't buy this idea that they were pressured. Well, this is a huge development. And as uh, Ron said, Alan Dershowitz, speaking of him, he is going to be on our program a little bit later and being interviewed by our very own Brian Ross. You're not going to want to miss that. We're going to take a break, but obviously this is an exciting day here on Law and Crime. We have a lot to talk about, and we are going to spe speak a little bit more about the police cover-up trial. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have more to discuss.